And now we have a general discussion, question and answer session. Uh, feel free to address any of the speakers you know, on any topic that they have uh, talked about or anything that is generally related to the topic of hauntings and ghosts. So if anyone has a question, we can just start. All of you guys have worked with this stuff for a long time now. Right. I'm curious if because you've worked with this for such a long time, if you've seen any development in your own latent abilities. I mean, working with this stuff day in and day out, does, does it rub off? Well, if you're going to be fine, nearest the microphone, um, I'm still hoping that I'm going to understand what I'm trying to find. Uh, uh, I've been at it a long time. I'm still convinced that there's something there that needs explaining. Whether I'm going about it the right way, I don't know. I'm not getting the kind of results that I would like to get, so maybe I'm not going about it the right way. But it, you know the, the, the old saying, because it's there. People say, why do you keep on doing it, Tony? Because it's there, and because it's something that we still yet, I think, do not fully understand. Mm -hmm. And I've started this journey and I shall continue to do it. Whether I shall enlighten us in my <coughs> investigations or not remains to be seen. Back yes, yeah. that's a point. Yeah. No, I, I, you've raised a point here. When people talk about deaths after that, I'm afraid I'm not too much of a believer. So I put it this way. I say that when I die, and when I get over there, if I find that there's nothing in it at all, <coughs> I'll come back and tell you so. Which uh, I think sums up the situation we have. Right. Thank you. Uh, I actually have noticed over the years uh, being more sensitive to these things, but also I've been more sensitive to noticing unusual things in the environment in general. And that's partly because I've been working with a lot of, I mean, I've used psychics quite a bit um, in the investigations I've done. It's kind of, I use them as a tool, like a detector of some kind. And that's to me what they are in this sense. But I've also noticed that I've been picking up a lot of the same stuff before they have or at the same time they have without voicing that at all. And I tend not to, in an investigation, actually voice any of that because I want to make sure that the other folks around me are getting what they need to be getting and the witnesses are explaining what they need to be explaining. Um, I haven't still seen a ghost, but I've had my own personal encounters of other sensations, you might say, and these sorts of things. And I've certainly experienced the imprint type of uh, phenomena, and I've seen things, certainly seen things moving around that were physical that everybody in the room saw uh, that we were able to, to deal with. And even we got on videotape in a couple of instances. So just the more, you're, more I'm around it, the uh, more fun I'm having with it. Yeah. Can I come back before, Doctor? He raised a point, too. I've been with people who've seen an apparition, and I haven't seen it. And this raises a question, why are they more sensitive than I? That's a, it's another thing, rather like you. I've yeah. never seen a ghost yet. But I don't, for one minute, think or doubt that the people who've seen the ghost won't actually see mm -hmm. it. They do exist. Just because I can't see it doesn't mean to say that it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge. If you're there, and somebody else is seeing it, and you're not. Why not? I don't expect it, but uh, uh, I'm a psychic as everybody without being a psychic or a medium. Uh, I remember in Dublin, uh, I was looking uh, at a house that uh, I'd heard had been haunted, and I knew nothing about it. But uh, when I approached the house, it was a sort of a cottage. I heard people in there arguing about a bit, about, about the, just arguing about a will. And uh, when I opened the door, there was nobody there. Turned out afterwards that uh, there had been a will fight, and I had walked into what uh, a replay, a replay from the past. That's about as psychic as you can get. Yes. Thank you. I have a question for all three of you. You might have a comment. I'm wondering if you, if any of you have a thought that there's something about the way we live today, our the current lifestyle, the noise, the the distractions, the the gadgets that fill our lives, all of these things. I wonder if this might account for a decline in sensitivity to these agencies, presences, phenomena, whatever you want to call them. Uh, my guess, because I think that Tony said something about that he felt there was a decline 
in the reports. And I'm wondering if there's a connection between the way we live and the general character of our culture. If you read the early reports, you'll see that most of the good reports were I was sitting quietly in a chair mm -hmm. or I was tending the garden. There was no noise, there was no distraction. As you say today, we're either looking at a computer, we're flying an aeroplane, there's a noise outside, we're on the telephone, we're busy all the time. Perhaps we're not getting ourselves into that same state that people <coughs> used to get in when they saw these things. I think you more or less take that. Yeah, I think we, um, we have so many distractions. I actually did a show, for, worked on a show for the Travel Channel last year. They wanted to do a show on Haunted Las Vegas, and I, I said to the director, you're kidding, right? <laughs> you could have 50,000 ghosts walking around Las Vegas, and with so many distractions, nobody would notice. Mm -hmm. you couldn't, they all look like Elvis, so, I mean, how could you notice? <laughs> It's really, it's an issue of, there, is, there are so many things even happening physically around us that we don't notice. The idea of things happening psychically around us um, that may not be as even as loud or visual as the physical stuff happening makes it difficult for us to attend to those things. I did an experiment with undergraduates years ago. We decided that we put on a ghost. Now, normally a ghost, as you know, looks like a, a, a normal human being. <coughs> So we had to follow the usual game of putting a white sheet on it. Made these undergraduates walk along a particular line, then put their hand behind them, <coughs> pull it away, and they disappeared. Uh, there were 54 people walking around, the backs didn't take the slightest bit of notice. <laughs> right. Not a bit of notice. We then thought, okay, we'll put it in a cinema in front of people. And during the uh, um, X trailer film, I went, I'm only very short, so we built my head up, we had this white sheet over me, and I walked across the screen one way, and walked back to the next, and 60% of the audience didn't see me. So perhaps the ghosts are all around us, and we're not taking much notice. I think if a uh, uh, spirit wants to manifest, they'll pay no attention to anything else they'll get through. Because in their level, at their level, uh, they don't even hear that distraction. You know, it uh, doesn't affect them. Any other questions? Yes, please. I wanted to ask you, gentlemen, about um, any personal experiences you may have had with friends or relatives who have passed. I got to know, in, in 1992, I got to know a gentleman by the name of Martin Caden. <clears throat> Marty was a science fiction writer and science writer who wrote, among other things, the book Cyborg, which became the Six Million Dollar Man. Heavily involved in the uh, space program, real science nut. And the first time I met him was at a press conference for a, con a conference in the Midwest. And he stated emphatically, tonight I will move objects with my mind. And he did. And over a few years after that, I actually worked with him on some PK work, and um, he told he had written a book called Ghosts of the Air, which talked about pilots' experience with ghosts, and I met a number of his buddies who had experiences on this. He died of cancer in March of 1997, and I had expected his ghost to show, I mean, this is a guy who was very bullheaded, very powerful kind of personality. Nothing for a week, week and a half goes by, and um, I'm driving to the Oakland airport from my home, 7 o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, my fairly new car was about three months old, fills up with the smell of really stinky cigar smoke. And I immediately associated, associated that mentally with Marty's cigars, because that smelled just like them. And I also felt like somebody was sitting next to me. So for five minutes, I'm driving down the freeway. People are probably thinking I'm singing, because my mouth is moving. And I'm saying goodbye to this guy. And, and I had no idea it was him, but that's what I felt. I got to Portland, Oregon that morning, made a phone call to one of Marty's friends in New Jersey, who was a pilot who I actually knew. And I got him on the phone and I said, Bob, it's Lloyd Auerbach. He said, I can't believe you're calling me. I was about to call you. I said, well, I'm not home. What's going on? He said, I was up flying my Cessna. And at about 10.10 this morning, my plane cockpit filled up the smell of Caden's cigar smoke. That's not the best part, he says to me. He says, I spoke to, and he mentioned another pilot's name down in Florida, who was up flying his plane about 10.20 his cockpit filled up with the smell of cigar smoke. Now this is East Coast time, this is like 10 minutes after my experience and another 10 minutes after that. So 
uh, I, you know, it was kind of a powerful experience. And I, my last comment to Bob was, "How come it took a week? It took him a week and a half?" And he said, <laughs> "He said, well, he had a, friend, a lot of friends around the world, and obviously we were lower on the list." You know? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of hurt, but you know, <laughs> that's my only experience there. I've had nothing like that. I would have liked to have had it, but nothing. I'm still waiting for my mother to come back. She would have done, I think, if she could. My father certainly wouldn't. Have. But my mother, on one or two occasions, when I was sort of having slight uh, difference of opinion with her, would say, you wait, I will come back. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be the time you really least expect it. <laughs> and would rather not see her. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Any other question? There's a perception that there are some areas on the planet which are more haunted than others. Uh, generally, uh, Great Britain is considered to be more haunted than the U.S. In America, people consider Gettysburg to be a very haunted piece of geography. Uh, amongst the three of you and your experiences around the world, have you noticed that to be uh, reality, or is it just uh, areas that are reported more? Well. Um, in agreement with what Dr. Holter said about imprints, I think that places with history, more history, are more likely to be haunted in that sense, not necessarily because of geophysical activity. Um, some of the studies of geomagnetics seem to indicate that fluctuations in the magnetic field on a local level could affect people's psychic perceptions, and perhaps that's what's going on. Uh, it's hard to know whether pumping up the energy is going to make people more psychic and perceptive or less, whether it gives energy to that imprint if that's what's going on. In other words, it may actually power the VCR that allows you to see what's going on. Uh, it's hard to say what's exactly going on environmentally that allows people to see these things or why certain events are recorded into the environment and others don't seem to play back constantly. Uh, I haven't seen anything when, with regards to ghost or apparition cases that relates to that directly. But um, it's kind of, right now we're still learning more and more about how magnetism and electromagnetism and geomagnetism affect the human brain affect behavior in general. It was only 1994 that Caltech even found magnetic particles in our brain tissue, which is something that's still being denounced by some of the skeptics. So there's a connection we have to the magnetic environment, but what that actually means, we don't know yet. Uh, we're still, at, we can't come to that kind of conclusion as yet. But it seems to be involved somehow, I think, in some of these imprints. I think the uh, <clears throat> idea of certain places being more haunted than others is the invention of the tourist uh, board and has no real truth. Uh, whatever seems to them to be saleable uh, is stressed, and what isn't, isn't. I'm not happy with the geomagnetic theory because uh, geomagnetism, when we have the alterations of the particles coming from the sun, affect the whole of the magnetic sphere of the Earth. <coughs> yeah. And to me, it's too general. It's not localized. I mean, a, a small country like, like England, for instance, the geomagnetic variation would probably cover the whole of it, if not half of it. Now, if there's a geomagnetic uh, effect in that respect that causes, as Persinger, I think, suggests, yeah. <coughs> that if it's high, uh, you get uh, apparitions. If, you, if it's low, I don't know if I go the right way around, uh, you get poltergeist effect. We've checked some of his work, and we're not exactly happy with what he has to say. He might be right, but the way he presents it, we're not happy. And not only that, from my personal point of view, I should have thought that it should have affected a lot more people than it does. If it's covering a large area of the country, then perhaps more people should be seeing apparitions than are reported. That's that one. But on the other hand, I think we must uh, have a look at the possible effect of geomagnetic uh, effects because there's some interesting results coming from stuff you said and also one or two, we've, one or two cases we've had in England suggest that there are localised magnetic variations. I'm not happy with it, but on the other hand, we still don't understand the effects uh, of apparitions. We don't know how they occur fully. There are some theories, okay, but I think it was looking at in much greater detail. That's all I can say. Yeah, I actually did a case a few years ago using a magnetometer, and we were able to, uh, the, the couple saw a woman's apparition, saw a figure, um, and they were pointing to where, it was, where she was moving, and we, were we actually literally followed a moving magnetic field around the house. 
when I talked to a very skeptical physicist about this, now this field was about three foot off the ground and went to a, another three foot high, and it was vaguely sp spherical. Um, this physicist I spoke to said there is nothing he knew of that could have caused this kind of effect to be measured, especially on a moving level. And he felt that if there were ghosts, <coughs> in this case, um, the magnetic field probably wasn't the ghost, but more like the wake the ghost left in the magnetic environment. Since those magnetometers measure change and shifts, he said that you have somebody walking through, it's like walking through water and leaving a wake behind you, that you're actually measuring the trail, so to speak. And it's interesting because in some respects, um, when I thought back at that point about what we measured, we were measuring a couple feet behind where they were pointing. So we're kind of following something. Now, he might have been right, he might have been wrong, but you know, it could have been, who knows what it was. It could have been a leprechaun, I don't know. But we, this is one of those cases, and we've had other cases like that, where we've had moving magnetic anomalies in interactive cases. We have static in, uh, magnetic anomalies in the, the imprint cases. We don't know why they're being caused. Some of them are on the geomagnetic frequency, some of them are not. It's just that some of them are all frequency levels. We don't know what's going on with that. And the weirdest thing is the ability to disrupt them, because we've had that case I mentioned with the living apparition. The psychic I work with disrupted the magnetic field in those three, place, th three places on the property that had this feeling. She did something visual, you know, visualization in her head, and, we, and the measurement was gone, just plain gone. We've actually disrupted it using um, a bulk tape eraser that you can buy at Radio Shack. It's gone. We have no idea why it was there to begin with. We have no idea why it's gone. Maybe it's a placebo on our part. I don't know, but um, we were waving around the, the earth, the salt, and the whole thing in some respects that Tony talked about. But the measurement was simply gone by doing something that makes sense in some weird way. So I don't know what, what we were actually even getting at that point. I think it wants further looking at, I must say. There seemed to be evidence this side of the Atlantic and also the other side. And uh, it's like we're just poo-pooing it. I mean, we've all got to try and look at various methods and explanations. And this is one I think that needs following up. What I do not agree with, I did mention it <coughs> rather briefly, was one of our <coughs> very eminent, if you like, uh, researchers who goes to a case and he thinks that there's nothing in it at all, and I'm talking about Richard Wiseman, bless his heart, so I know very well, came out with a theory, <coughs> having looked at ghosts in Edinburgh, and surprised us all by telling us that the Edinburgh Castle Complex is the most, one of the most haunted uh, places in England. A good few of us didn't know that. We know it now. And they've come to the conclusion, that, or he's come to the conclusion, that if you generate electrical currents, then you will make people see ghosts. Well, we know that if you fool around with <coughs> magnet magnetometers near the brain, you can produce uh, peculiar effects in the brain. I mean, experiments like that have been done. But I think he's trying to make it a little bit too simple for the simple reason that there were no electrical mains around, in, as I said earlier, in Greek and Roman days and they were seeing ghosts, so I don't think that that's got anything to do with it. But the <coughs> suggestions you're making, I certainly think they're following up. We get a lot of calls at the Foundation for Amateur uh, Ghost Investigators, and in light of all your expertise, I was wondering if you have a few words of advice for the amateur as they set off on their ghost investigations. <sighs> <laughs> I, I, I should say that Dr. Holzer, I met Dr. Holzer when I was in high school and he gave me advice to become a parapsychologist, so. <laughs> no, well, sorry. Uh, try to be uh, as scientific as you can, ask questions, ask for witnesses, and uh, if there's something to it, then come back with a medium. Nothing works without a medium. That's my advice. Because my advice would be um, to, to actually ask a lot of questions, to walk in with that open mind, to not be satisfied with uh, one reading, because too, too many of the amateurs actually are satisfied no. with just getting a nice reading on their magnetometer without figuring out that it's actually the coffee machine in the next room. Because right. um, I've seen that happen. <laughs> Uh, and not be satisfied with the, the spirit of the, the photos. I think that in one respect, if you don't have living witnesses, you're, you can pretty much get unusual readings on any of your equipment anywhere if you really want to. But it's got to dovetail or connect to a human experience. 
because it's by human experience we're defining these very, ex very things that we're talking about today. Without human beings, we've got nothing. That's how we define consciousness itself, which uh, is an interesting thing in its, of itself. There's a lot of research going on uh, in California on consciousness, and it, it connects a lot to this. And it's just interesting that consciousness is the only thing that tries to measure itself. So without that measurement of itself, the experience of knowing itself and knowing the experience, you, you just have a bunch of anomalous readings in the environment. That's all you have. So um, the reliance on technology is a, the thing I'd say that people need to watch out for. And I actually think that bringing in sensitives and psychics can help because you're bringing in a t potentially other witnesses yeah. who can verify the people's experience. I think it's vital to do that. I'm going to look at the question another way. I think what you're asking is should uh, people continue to be uh, amateurs rather than become professional parapsychologists? Well, there's a place for both, I think. The only problem that we've come across in the Society for Psychic Research when we're giving out grants and also the experience that we've had in Cambridge amongst one or two professional parapsychologists are that there is a great temptation perhaps perhaps, I emphasize, perhaps, to exaggerate your results, because if you don't exaggerate <laughs> results, you're not going to get results in the, in, in the laboratory by the look of it. And if you don't get results, you're not going to get grants. And if you don't get grants, you can't carry on as, as a professional parapsychologist. It's, it's a very great problem. We had one gentleman who was well known in the field of the time, and I'm not going to mention his name, it would be wrong to do so because it's all over and done with. But he was in Cambridge University, the uh, psychology part of it, doing parapsychological work, and very good work. He's getting exceptionally good results, much higher results than anybody else. And we were worried about this. In fact, we were asked by one or two quite prominent American parapsychologists to look into his work. And we looked into it because the results were so consistent that they didn't tie up with anybody else's. Yeah. And frankly, we couldn't <coughs> find anything no. wrong no. with his work. No. His no. randomization no. procedure no. was perfectly all right. No. But there is that temptation. And I think there is the place for the amateur. But of course, in this field, it really is so controversial that can you say that anybody who's interested in this is a true amateur? You've got to have a knowledge of science. You've got to have a knowledge of human nature. Basically, I think what you need, more than anything else, is common sense. The amateur also, I think, uh, can in a way stand back and look at it all. He's not committed to it. The parapsychologist professional is committed to it. And if he doesn't get results, there's no living. And there isn't a great deal of money about either this side of the Atlantic or the other side of the Atlantic these days for professional work. I mean, uh, Bob Morris in Edinburgh is doing quite well, but he's always got financial problems. We know those. I know Bob extremely well. The SPR in London has got financial problems. I know that the American SPR has got financial problems. Uh, in Europe, uh, <coughs> there isn't the kind of money being put into the subject. So there is a place for the amateur, but the amateur must, I think, be very careful in the way he approaches it. He's got to have, as you've said, and we've all said, an open mind. He's got to have a knowledge of science. He's got to have a knowledge of human beings, and he's got to be very careful with his results. He should read up all the background. There's a, a wealth of material in various libraries that he should read and see what people have done in the past and follow their line. So I'm all for the amateur, but an amateur that has to be careful with what he does. At the very least, read something about parapsychology, because so many of the amateurs I get, get uh, emails from, they get all their information from other amateur groups on the internet. And yeah. it's very frightening. They don't even, um, some of them don't even know um, anything about research in parapsychology. They know nothing about what's gone on before in ghost investigations. Nothing whatsoever. They haven't even read, read Dr. Holter's books, which I find, frankly, that's kind of bizarre. Because Dr. Holter's books are, are easy to find. They're very easy to find, and they're very good books. So that it worries me significantly when I find that happening. This uh, closes the discussion period. 
And now to finish the activities of today, our executive director, the Lisette Colley, is going to have some final comments. Thanks. Well, it's my task to very unhappily bring this forum to a close. I would very much like to thank our speakers, Tony Cornell, Dr. Hans Holzer, and Lloyd Auerbach, and of course our moderator, Dr. Alvarado, who shared with us so eloquently, I'm sure you'll agree, their expertise in this fascinating area. <coughs> and compassionate <coughs> individuals who strive to come to some sense of the phenomena which historically has puzzled mankind continues and most probably will continue to puzzle us. But as we have all experienced here today, with critical thinking and scientific methodology, we will undoubtedly eventually reach the answers we seek. And until then, Parapsychology Foundation stands ever ready to assist one and all in your continued investigations into the paranormal. selection. My name is Lisette Coley and I serve as president of Parapsychology Foundation. I hope you give us a like and if you have a comment then do so below and we'll try and better serve you. Any suggestions are welcome. And we want to thank very much our loyal subscribers. This is a relatively new channel and a new venture for Parapsychology Foundation so we very much appreciate uh, your loyalty. And if you haven't decided to subscribe Maybe pretty please you could. So